Please join me in the responsive call to worship. We are the church, the tall and the small, the young and the old, the wise and the foolish. We are the church. May we learn from one each other, have ears open to the good news, and hearts open to be God's family. We are the church. A place to be ourselves, a new way of living, a community of forgiveness, a song in the world, a story of renewal. We are the church, and all are welcome. Our uh, first hymn is, uh, it's going to be new words, but the tune will be very familiar. It is uh, the tune of Be Thou My Vision. This is uh, a hymn written by uh, Carolyn Winfrey Gillette, who uh, along with her husband is a Presbyterian minister. She is a hymn writer. Um, sometimes they serve together as co-pastors. I think right now she's filling in because her husband had some surgery recently. But she wrote this, uh, this hymn, which um, sent the, the music to, and it is uh, uh, kind of, a, I guess for Mother's Day, is, is a way to um, honor those uh, women in our lives who have been um, influential in helping us to grow in our faith. And so um, we will sing. Your voice, 
slow to drop the deadly demands that compete for our attention. Call us again, we pray, and summon us to lives of gracious service. Fashion us into faithful followers who hear Christ's commands and respond with courage and compassion so that we might proclaim your reign of love. Sisters and brothers, hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ, and Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Thanks be to God. Glory to God, whose goodness shines on me, and to the Son, whose grace has pardoned me, and to the Spirit, whose love has set me free, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be. Without end, without end, amen. Well, without end, without end, amen. Well, without end, without end, amen. As it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be. Let us pray. Gracious God, send us your spirit to guide us into the truth, so that we may know and trust the good news of the gospel, and look with hope and joy for the life of the world to come. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our first scripture reading is Acts 18, verses 1 through 4. Listen for the word of God. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus. He had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul visited with them. Because they practiced the same trade, he stayed and worked with them. They all worked with them. Every Sabbath, he interacted with people in the synagogue, trying to convince both Jews and Greeks. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. And now it's our time for young disciples. Say, Pastor Jim, I just want to tell you, there is nothing greater than a gator. Hey, how about them gnolls? How about them gnolls? Hey, better than those gators. Uh, well, you know, we are living in West Virginia now, okay. so right. I have found myself inclined to say, let's go mountaineers. Uh, we are Marshall. Oh, uh, you know, we can't disagree, we can't agree on this, but... 
there is maybe something we can agree on. We're both Presbyterians. Oh, sure, sure. So how about those senators down in Davis and Elkins right down the road from us? That's pretty good, but, uh, you know, I'm going to have to go with Hanover College because both of my parents went to there. We still... Oh, there is one team we can both be on. Here's what that is. We can both be Mets fans. Yeah, let's, let's go, go Mets. You know, Paul writing to his friends in a church that he had started and visited had heard stories about how they were breaking up into sides. Some said they were on Team Cephas. Some said they were on Team Paul. And he writes to them and he tells them, you are not on different teams. You do not need to be divided. You have all been baptized into Christ. And in Christ, we are one body. That is where our unity is. That's still true for us today. We are separated, but we are still united. For in Christ, we are joined together into one body. So let's pray together, even though we are separated, in a repeat after me prayer. Let's pray. Dear God. Dear God. We give you thanks. We give you thanks. That in you. That in you. We are united. We are united. That through Christ. That through Christ. We are together. We are together. And that by your Holy Spirit. And that by your Holy Spirit, we are bound together in love. That we are bound together in love. Amen. Amen. I have one more thing I want to mention to you. This week, you are going to be getting something called a Flat Jesus. Uh, it's a little play on another book about, what is it, Flat Sam, who travels around the world. So when you get this, I want you to color it. I, I want you to cut it out, and then I want you uh, to take Jesus with you wherever you go, even if that's only to the backyard or the front porch or into the kitchen, and I want you to take pictures of you with flat Jesus and then send them to Pastor Jim at HardyNet, was it HardyNet.com? Pastor Jim at HardyNet.com. Yeah. And so we can share them with each other, because even in this time... Jesus is always with us. Oops. Sorry, I'm tripping up over the uh, team cups. There we go. Okay. Last week, we heard the story of Paul's visit to Thessalonica. After a stop in Athens afterwards, Paul headed to Corinth, a bustling port, and there he met a couple by the name of Priscilla and Aquila, who became close friends and important co-workers in Paul's ministry. One reason for their friendship, besides their common faith, was their common occupation. When Paul wasn't preaching, he was trying to make a living. He didn't spend all his time at church. He was out in the world, working like everyone else, and his work was tent making. Now, I was looking forward to the Olympics this summer, but it looks like we're going to have to all wait another year before that happens. Back when Paul was in Corinth, just a few miles down the road were the Isthmian Games, second in importance only to the Olympic Games, and they drew a huge number of spectators. There were few places for visitors to stay, so many people slept in tents. And sometimes those tents needed repair, which is what probably kept Paul and Aquila and Priscilla very busy. I'm guessing that Paul also must have been watching the games, because several times in his letters, Paul describes the life of a Christian as like running a race. Well, Paul stayed about a year and a half in Corinth and then left for the city of Ephesus in what is now Western Turkey. There he received a letter and a report about some troubles at the church in Corinth, which prompted Paul to write the letter that we call 1 Corinthians. Listen for the word of God as it comes to us from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 through 18. 
Now I encourage you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, agree with each other and don't be divided into rival groups. Instead, be restored with the same mind and the same purpose. My brothers and sisters, Chloe's people gave me some information about you, that you're fighting with each other. What I mean is this, that each one of you says, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, I belong to Christ. Has Christ been divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in Paul's name? Thank God that I didn't baptize any of you, except Crispus and Gaius, so that nobody can say that you were baptized in my name. Oh, I baptized the house of Stephanus too. Otherwise, I don't know if I baptized anyone else. Christ didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the good news. And Christ didn't send me to preach the good news with clever words, so that Christ's cross won't be emptied of its meaning. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are being destroyed, but it is the power of God for those of us who are being saved. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You know, every week I pour water into this bowl. It's a reminder of our baptism. And there's a lot of important imagery in this sacrament. When I preside at a baptism, I remind everyone that water cleanses, water purifies, water refreshes, water sustains. But there's an even more important action taking place which Paul lifts up in his letter. Now the challenge when we read Paul's letters is that we're only reading one side of the conversation. Sometimes it's hard to figure out what's happening. But the situation in Corinth is this. There are factions and infighting and taking sides. When Paul left Corinth, the congregation was harmonious. Now, Quarrels are splitting the church. After his greeting, Paul jumps right into the big issue in his letter. Agree with each other and don't be divided into rival groups. You see, the congregation has split into camps with each claiming a different preacher as their favorite and declaring their preacher superior to the others. And maybe most of us can probably relate. It's always hard when a church calls a new pastor. Some love the old pastor. Some are looking forward to the new pastor. Some still remember the pastor who married them or baptized their children or presided over the funeral of their parents. Paul mentions a few preacher evangelists in his letter. Paul himself, of course. And then there's Apollos, a charismatic speaker and then Cephas, or Peter, as he is better known, one of the original 12. These are all good leaders in the church, sharing in their unique ways the good news of Christ. But the Corinthians have foolishly placed their emphasis on the messenger instead of the message, and that has divided them. These factions can only talk at each other. No one is listening, really listening. Things have gotten so bad, the congregation has to send a messenger bearing a letter all the way to Ephesus, probably a week or more journey from Corinth. Now I imagine Paul kind of shaking his head or maybe doing a face plant in disbelief at what he is reading. When he has finally calmed himself down, Paul begins his letter reminding the congregation of what he taught them, our unity through baptism and the foolishness of the cross. Foolishness to the people in the Corinth church bragging about who baptized them. This is where Paul lifts up this idea of foolishness to point out how foolish they are being. This is the language Paul uses as he writes about the central event of our faith. And to be sensible and to the sensible and wise minds in our world, 
the message of the cross is foolishness. In a culture that emphasizes success and winning and power, we're told to rely on our own efforts and to believe we are in control of our lives. In the end, worldly wisdom is all about the ways we live for ourselves and not in service to others. It's all about trusting in ourselves instead of trusting in God. But the message of the cross has as its center Jesus Christ, who wasn't a victorious general or an eloquent politician or even a successful businessman. Yes, he taught and performed great miracles among us, but at the height of his ministry on earth, he chose to give up all of the things we would imagine when we think of divine power. He was arrested, found guilty, and crucified. Now, as Christians, we like to skip ahead and focus on Jesus being raised from the dead, victorious over sin and death. But Paul says we can't look only to the resurrection unless we focus on the cross as well. For in the cross, God's true nature is revealed, not in a dramatic demonstration of power, but in weakness and vulnerability. This is the message of the cross we proclaim to the world. Now, it's a wonder anyone believed it. Apparently, it was too foolish for the Corinthians. Paul found himself having to address a congregation that he had started which was coming apart, but it was more than a debate over who is the best preacher. In the rest of the letter, we learn many other factors are troubling the congregation. Many of the problems in Corinth reflected a church community caught up in the pop trends of the day that placed an emphasis on the individual, on self-indulgence and self-sufficiency. Society exerts some of the same pressures today. We're told the ones we should look up to are the famous and the rich and the powerful and the gifted. Some look up to movie stars or athletes or music idols. Every week there are more books and articles and TED Talks about how to be successful and happy, how to have a better life. Well, the message of the cross turns the wisdom of the world upside down. It communicates the power of divine love a love that ignores any of the labels we humans use to identify who is in and who is out, us and them. The foolish message of the cross was powerful in the first few centuries. It brought both rich and poor, slave and free to the church. It gave them a different vision of how to live together in community. And this unity was made possible and visible, Paul writes, through baptism. It's, it's why I splash this water in this bowl every week. We have been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. We are joined to Christ in his one body that we call the church. Paul's point is that the unity he seeks for the Corinthian church comes from their shared connection through baptism to Jesus Christ who was crucified and through him to one another. The unity that Paul urges on the Corinthians comes through a baptism that connects all participants to Christ's death and resurrection. Baptism changes us. For Paul, the death and resurrection of Christ marks the beginning of a new age. All the ways we try to divide ourselves into groups are no longer interesting or important or defining. To be baptized is to be joined with all the other baptized to the risen life of Christ and to be as Christ is, numbered among God's children. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Friends, now I ask you to join me in saying what we believe using the affirmation of faith that is in the bulletin. This is taken from Paul's letter to the church in Philippi, Philippians 2, 6 through 11, together. We believe that Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Let us now turn our hearts to God in prayer. Lord, we are here. Perhaps not unlike Jesus' first disciples, we come to you a little fearful, scattered, grateful for our encounters with the risen Christ, but troubled and unsure what to do next. As we continue to worship in our separate spaces, we long to be together, gathered in your home, brought to the places you prepare for us. In our anxiety over the duration of this pandemic and in our worries about the many and long ramifications of this trying time, we want desperately to believe in you and believe in Jesus. We pray for an outpouring of your spirit. Send the Comforter, our Advocate, to show us the way, remind us of the truth, and grant us abundant life. Lord, we have questions. We know there are lessons we should know well, but cannot seem to recall. We feel upended by so much change and so little control. We confess that there are commandments of Jesus we remember but struggle to keep. We need to be honest about our misgivings and doubts, confident that you will love us to the end. And despite our failings, we share with you all that troubles our hearts. We are troubled by the mounting deaths caused by COVID-19. We are troubled by the growing numbers of lost jobs and economic turmoil. We are troubled by our inability to be close to the ones we love when they need us the most. We are troubled by children missing out on their education and those who wonder when they will eat next and those with no place to find shelter. We are troubled by the people wrestling with addiction, those suffering from mental illness, and those languishing in loneliness. We are troubled by pain within and without, the violence inflicted on the innocent, the cruelty perpetuated, perpetrated on the vulnerable, scarcity that belies your generosity and abundance. Lord, we come to you, aching to be given a place to rest and a space to set our burdens down. We come to you because we believe in you, in your grace and your mercy, in your compassion and your power. You promise us spaces of rest, 
inexplicable peace, joy not dependent on our circumstances. In you we find our home. You set us free to do your work in this world. Grant us the courage to name how we feel, to lament what we see, and then turn us toward the people who need their hearts put at ease. Make us living stones who create buildings of relief, shelters of compassion, tabernacles of mercy. Lord, we boldly ask to follow you so closely that others will come to know you and believe in you through our work and our witness. May our faithful discipleship ease our troubled hearts and perpetuate the love of the one in whose name we pray, our Savior Jesus Christ, who taught us to say when we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Once again, this is our t offering time, and I will just continue to thank everyone for the ways that you have continued to support the church and to support those in our community. Uh, and I hope you will continue that. Um, the needs are still there. Uh, yes, we are starting to, to get out of the homes a little bit and, and to get out into the community, but the, the need still exists. And I hope and pray and, uh, that you'll continue to do as you have done already and, and have done wonderfully. And so in uh, that spirit, let us join together in the prayer of dedication for all the gifts that you have given together. Eternal God, take and use our gifts for your purpose in the world, giving food to the hungry, hope to the despairing, and new life to the dead. Teach us to live each day for you, so that future generations will know your goodness and praise. Amen. Our uh, last hymn is They'll Know We Are Christians by Our Love.
praise to the Spirit who makes us one, and they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. Friends, Hear these words from the Apostle Paul. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. As we lead this worship, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us this day and every day. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Blessed be the tide that finds our hearts in Christian love. The fellowship of kindred minds is like to that above. Friends, go in peace.